into the safety. Uh, meet Daniel. He's uh, been in fall protection and industry for seven years. He's got all the training from OSHA, 30 hour level three award in training. Um, he's written articles uh, and professional development webinars for EHS. And he's a speaker at the 2019 International Society for Fall Protection. So I'm going to let Daniel take it away. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Rob. And I want to thank uh, everybody at Advanced Roofing for being our partner and allowing us to be part of this webinar and talk to you guys today about rooftop fall protection um, and keeping your employees safe on your buildings. It's something that I personally have uh, learned and developed a passion for the last about eight years now, um, coming up on about eight and a half years doing this. And as Rob said, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time. I've been through a whole lot of trainings. I've written some articles on fall protection. I was invited as a speaker at the International Society for Fall Protection in New Orleans last year, which was a huge honor. And I'm actually going to talk to you guys um, about the same things that I talked about at the symposium. So just to kind of jump into an overview of what we're going to talk about today. In my eight years, you know, I've been on hundreds of roofs all over the U.S., and I see the same hazards over and over and over again. There is nothing new, nothing surprises me anymore. And so what I want to do is just boil those down to basically there's four. There's four hazards that we see over and over again. So we're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about the OSHA codes that apply to those hazards. So I want you guys to understand the hazards that are on your roof understand what OSHA has to say about those hazards. Now, I also like to talk about the logic behind the OSHA code. Like, it's not good enough for me just to understand this is what OSHA says. I wanna know why OSHA thinks it's so critically important we protect those areas. And then we're gonna talk about the solutions um, to solve those hazards. And if you guys have questions on those solutions, we are the manufacturer and we are partnered with Advanced Roofing. Um, we've trained Advanced Roofing, so if you have questions after the webinar on getting these solutions or having a um, site assessment done by an advanced roofing individual, just give them a call and they'll be happy to set that up. Now, before I jump into our first um, hazard overview, what I wanna do is, is just kind of put this idea in your head, which is to pay attention to the order in which I present these hazards. Because the number one question that I get asked when I go onto your roofs is, all right, I don't have unlimited money. My budget is, is not unlimited. If I were to protect one thing, what should that thing be? And the order in which I present these hazards is the order in which I um, advocate that we should be protecting them on your roof if you can only do one at a time. So pay attention to the order in which I present them. And um, I'll kind of explain my reason for why I have them ordered the way that I do. So first hazard that I want to talk about on your roof are your access points. Now, access points, let's dive in to what OSHA has to say about access points. And then I'm going to justify why I think they're the first thing that I want to protect on your roof. In the OSHA code is 1910.28. This is a new OSHA code that came out in January of 2016. It was updated for the first time in 40 years, um, but the OSHA code didn't change that much. There's only one word that changed in this particular sentence, um, which I'm going to point out in a minute, but let's break into it. OSHA says that each employee needs to be protected from falling by a ladderway floor hole or a ladderway platform hole. So what do they mean by that? What is a ladderway floor hole and what is a ladderway platform hole? A floor hole is a roof hatch. It's where the, the roof itself is acting as a floor or your walking working surface and the access point is a hole through that floor. A ladderway platform hole is a fixed ladder on the side of your building. It's where your roof is acting as a platform that you're stepping off of to do a transition or to egress um, and that's what they consider a platform hole, is the hole that you could fall off of the platform. And it says that we need to protect those by a guardrail system and tow boards erected on all exposed sides, except at the entrance to the hole where a self-closing gate or an offset must be used. Now, when it talks about 
um, self-closing gates. I want to talk about that in a little bit. We'll get there. Um, but what I want to talk about is it's saying, listen, you need to put a guardrail to protect that hazard, except for where people have to pass through, where you have to put a self-closing gate or an offset. But let's answer the question that I threw out in the beginning. And that is, why do I say that access points are critically important to protect on your rooftop? You know, when I do in-person trainings, I always kind of throw this out as a question. Answers I get back a lot are, well, you know, it's, it's the first hazard that you come in contact with on the roof. It's the first one that you see. Um, well, those are all very true. The actual reason is much more logical. You know, first we have to understand how do we actually assess risk in the first place. And the way that we do that is by using a risk assessment matrix, right? There's a lot of different versions of these out there, um, you know, but the most common one, you know, we have the potential severity on the left-hand side of the um, chart and then the likelihood across the top. And the way that it works is you, you rank a hazard's potential severity um, on one to five, where one's being where one is considered insignificant and five is considered a debilitating injury. And then you multiply that number times the likelihood that an accident will occur, and you get either a green, amber, or red, you know, neutral, moderate, or critical rating on your hazard. So this is a very common, I, I bet probably 95% of you have seen this or seen something like it and used it before. Now in fall protection, it's pretty simple to figure out potential severity, right? Pretty much every fall hazard is a five. OSHA considers the minimum height requirement for fall protection in general, general industry to be four feet. Now, I know a lot of you are probably shaking your head and saying, no, no, I went through an OSHA class. It's six feet. It's six feet if you're doing new construction, right? That's 1926. Your guys going up servicing your roof and servicing the HVAC equipment, they are four feet. So let's think about this as severity. If I'm standing on a four foot table, I'm six foot tall and I fall backwards, my, my head is 10 feet away from the ground. And if I land on the back of my neck, that's a debilitating injury, right? So that's a five at our minimum threshold of four feet. Where people get kind of caught up is on likelihood, right? What's the likelihood that this guy's gonna fall? Does it depend on his training, the weather, his personality, right? So let's try and think about what is the number one factor in determining the likelihood of an accident is the frequency of exposure to that hazard. The more um, frequency that you have to that hazard, the more likely you are to have an accident around that hazard. So if we switch at the top, we switch the word likelihood with the word frequency of exposure, it becomes much easier to understand and kind of measure this. So if you, if you just click on the next one, it'll show, it'll show it with frequency of exposure at the top. So now let's take this back to fall protection, right? So let's think of an example on our roof. So I've got an example here. And you guys are going to be given a poll in a minute, but let's show the roof on the next slide. And it shows for just as the example, we're going to say that my primary access point is that hatch in the middle. And I'm going to service the, um, that rooftop unit, that roof fan twice per year. I'm going to reseal the skylights one time per year. I need to service that HVAC equipment near the edge four times per year. And I need to clean those gutters on that bottom edge two times per year. And we're assuming that they're separate trips. So the pull, the question that we're gonna throw out to you guys is, which hazard are your workers exposed to most frequently? So I'll give you guys you know, 30 seconds for those um, answers to come in, just to see what you guys think. What is the most, which hazard are the workers exposed to most frequently? If you're the polling, uh, if you don't see it pop up on your screen at the bottom, it should be blinking and it says polls. So we'll give you guys 30 seconds to respond there, and then I'll give you guys the answer. And think about the number, think about the count of exposures as well. All right, roof drains near edge, we have 19%, HVAC equipment 
Now, 43% of you guys absolutely nailed it, the roof hatch. But let's just jump real back real quick if we can, Jess, to take a look at that roof. And on that roof, let's just count up the number of exposures. So four times per year, I'm going to that HVAC equipment, right? So that's the most frequented unit up there. But I'm going to hit my access point. And I'm, I'm going to hit my access point every time I go up and every time I come back down again. So my number of exposures at my access point, let's add them up. Two plus one is three plus four is seven plus two is nine times two for every time I go up and every time I come back down, I have 18 hazard exposure events at my access point. I am exponentially higher um, on my hazard exposure at my access point, which is why I say that access points are so critically important for you guys to protect on your roofs. So let's just jump down um, to the next slide. We're gonna take a second look at this OSHA code. And we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about a few more things in the code. That last sentence, it says where a self-closing gate or an offset must be used. So the question that we get asked a lot is, can I actually use a chain to protect my access point? Because the code used to say that you could use what's called a swing gate at the entrance to the hazard. It, the only word that has changed in this code is that word self-closing. That's the only update. So I'm, I want to answer the question to you, can you protect can you protect your access points using chains? And the answer is simply no, you can't. Um, OSHA in the Federal Register states that OSHA believes that double chains do not fully protect workers from falls at whole entrances and is therefore adopting the existing and proposed requirements at entrances to laterally floor and platform holes, saying that you need to use a self-closing gate or be offset, right? That's all just a bunch of OSHA uh, talking saying, listen, you can't use chains to protect your guys. It comes straight from the federal register, which is what OSHA used to um, basically defend every piece of text that they changed in the new code when it came out. Um, they went on to say that the hazard is actually when you're coming down a ladder and you're required to reach up and reattach that chain, that is a hazardous event doing that action. And that's why they need, um, you need to start using self-closing gates immediately. There is no grandfather clause here. I get asked that question a lot. Um, it, it's just a matter of it needs to be done. So we have another poll that we're gonna throw up to you guys. And that is, what are the primary means of access to your roof? You know, check all that apply. And when, and I always call this kind of like a point of, of retrospection or introspection, looking at your rooftop, thinking about how are your employees getting access to the roof? And as you're thinking about it, think about, are they protected from a fall through that opening or to the side of that opening? Few more reasons why access points are so important to protect is that they also act as a natural gathering point for people. You know, I walk roofs all the time and you wait for everybody to get up on the roof, standing next to the ladder, or you're waiting for everybody to get down off the roof and you're all standing near the ladder, so you're standing near the edge and you're not protected. So here we have 95% of you responded that you have roof hatches up on your roof. My question to you is, are they protected? Are they safe? Do we have a railing around that? So Jess, we're gonna jump two slides down to take a look at what do we need to do to protect 95% of you that have um, roof hatches on your roof. These are available for, from your experts over at Advanced Roofing, their key hatch. It's a railing system that will go around your roof hatch. We actually mount it to the curb or drip edge, so we're not actually going into your roofing product so that we're not messing with that beautiful roof that Advanced put up there for you. Um, they're all modular based, so they're pretty fairly 
simple to install and adjust to no matter what your layout is on your roof. It doesn't matter what type of roof hatch you have. You can see we've got a whole bunch at the bottom. We can fit to, you know, get on any type of hatch. So your question is, how are we getting onto the roof through these hatches and are the hatches protected? The next solution that we have is a key guard ladder kit. So if you have a fixed ladder on your roof, which I think was 54% of you responded that you do, um, what we do is we provide a non-penetrating rooftop system. Um, and basically it clamps to either side of your ladder. We have counterbalanced recycled PVC weights that sit on top of your roof that are not tying in, are not gonna punch holes into it cause any roof leaks and we exceed the OSHA requirements for a, um, a railing system and we're able to give you safe access and a self-closing gate. We'll typically offset the, the gate in front of your ladder. Um, a pet peeve of mine is when a ladder gets installed directly onto a, or sorry, a gate gets installed directly onto a ladder and it's like pinching your fingers and it's really annoying as you're trying to get onto the roof. So we'll build a little bit of a gap there so that you can transition your center of mass onto the roof and then just push through the self-closing gate to get on. Once again, totally available through your guys over there at Advanced Roofing. Now, so that's it for access points. Next poll is our introduction to the next hazard that I think is so critical, and that is skylights. How many skylights do you have on your roof currently? You know, are we looking at zero to five, five to 12, 12 to 20, 20 plus? And do you even know? Um, skylights are so critically important to protect on your roofs. Statistically, more people fall through the roof than off of it. More people fall through skylights than off of the side of the building. And there's a few reasons for that. Number one is the, um, they're out of sight, out of mind, right? You get a little bit of sun glare. Um, you get a little bit of, um, you know, sun blindness up, up on that roof. You're not near the edge. You don't feel like you're, you're not protected. So, you know, there you are exposed to a fall hazard. So 67% say zero to five, um, which is great. And then our next biggest number is 24%, which is 20 plus, which that's actually straight in line with kind of my experience is either you have none or you have a whole bunch on your roof that need to be protected. So what does OSHA say about it? What does OSHA say about skylights? Do we really need to protect them? Black and white text. Each employee is protected from falling through any hole. And in the code, it says including skylights. I didn't put that in there. Um, and the skylight that's four feet or more above a lower level by one or more of the following and then they give us options. In the past code, they didn't give us any options. They said you need a self-closing gate and a railing. Here they say, listen, you can use a cover, which I'll explain in a minute, a guardrail, a travel restraint, or a personal fall arrest system to protect that skylight. So I have three things I wanna address about skylights. Number one, what I said before, skylights are not near the edge of the roof. So you have a false sense of security when you're walking past the skylight, you don't feel like, oh my God, I'm near the edge of the roof. You know, I'm, I'm being really careful. So you're not thinking that way. Number two, skylights are hidden. And they're hidden in three different ways. Sun blindness, which I mentioned to you guys being down in Florida. Number two is they're covered by dust, debris, or snow. I'm coming to you guys here from sunny Buffalo, New York, where uh, coverage by snow is a big deal. And yes, it was 32 degrees when I woke up this morning. I'm not making that up. So like snow's a big deal even into May, apparently, up here. Um, and then number three is skylights can be covered by paint. You know, if you look at that sloped roof on our model, those flat translucent panels are the most dangerous thing when it comes to skylights on your roofs. A lot of times the life of that roof will be extended by doing like a Galvalume spray over it and those skylights get covered. In some states, I'm not sure about Florida, but I know that's actually illegal to cover those. Um, I'm not sure what the rules are in Florida, but it doesn't matter. They have to be protected according to OSHA using a cover, guardrail, travel restraint, or arrest. So let's look at the solutions. Um, 
and I don't want to advance the slides yet. I knew that I was going to trigger you to do that, Jess. I apologize. Um, I just want to talk through them really quick. So cover, cover is going to be a screen, right? We're going to put a screen over that skylight. We have solutions for that. A guardrail is a railing system around it, which will show a solution for that. I want to talk specifically about travel restraint and personal fall rest systems. In fall protection terms, that's an anchor point and a harness, and you're tied off to either a, a lifeline or, like I said, an anchor point. Travel restraint means that I can walk up to the hazard but not fall through the hazard. So I have a, a, a leash on. Basically, I can get to the point of falling but not actually fall. Personal fall arrest means that I can fall, um, but if I do my math right, I won't hit the ground when I fall, right? I mean, that's just real basic. So here's my issue, is that a travel restraint system, I think is a great solution around skylights, but as someone who has had to design travel restraint systems around skylights, it's extremely difficult to do when you have more than one, right? As soon as you get a bank of skylights and you're standing in the middle of it, it's impossible to be in fall restraint. Fall arrest is a great solution for fall protection on the edge, but not great for skylights. Because the issue is fall arrest requires a certain fall distance to be safe, right? Around 16 to 18 feet. But I don't know what's below that skylight when I fall through it, right? If you look at our example, it's over a, where a warehouse. You know, ceiling to floor, that warehouse might be 25, 30 feet. But if I got a bunch of racking in that warehouse that I could hit once I fall through that skylight, that's an issue. And that's why it's so critically important to have somebody who knows what they're talking about from advance come out and take a look and ask all of these questions before you just start to self-diagnose solutions. So looking at our solutions in particular, we will provide skylight screens. Um, the skylight screens, if it's a dome system, we use a tension rod to fit it around the curve the curb of the skylight, so we're not actually penetrating the skylight. We custom manufacture these, so we just need to know the dimensions um, of those. For flat translucent panels, you know, we'll just mount over the top of it with a grid, like in that second photo at the bottom, um, to protect the fall. And those meet the OSHA requirements for a cover. So, and then as far as guardrails are concerned, we can protect that using what we call our ketome system which is a non-penetrating railing system that boxes out the curb of the skylight. Uh, if you just wanna to jump to the next slide there, Jess, to show them what that looks like. We set that recycled PVC weight within two inches of the skylight, and it just boxes out that curb and gives you an OSHA compliant guardrail. And we can do any size shape skylight on this. Um, we're not limited by size like we are on the screens. So this works really, really well when it comes to um, non, you know, non-standard size skylights, I would say. So that's it for skylights, guys. I just wanted to talk about that very, very quickly. The next thing that we're gonna talk about is typically what I'm called in to talk about. And to intro this concept, we have a video. So Jess, I'll let you play that video and I'll jump in what's exclusive. <laughs> In January 2017, OSHA updated the Fall Protection Standard, the code that protects the everyday general maintenance roof worker. It was the first the code had been updated in 40 years and let companies know that worker safety was a paramount concern. Since the update, the fines for inadequate fall protection have increased 88%. Of course, it's a much higher cost for the worker. So how do we assess risk on a roof? The industry uses a tool called the Risk Assessment Matrix, where the likelihood of a fall is measured against its severity. For most roofs, any fall is pretty severe. It's the likelihood that has the most questions. Unprotected edges pose an obvious likely risk that needs to be addressed. And under the new OSHA code, there are three categories of unprotected roof edges, defined as zones with specific requirements for fall protection. Zone 1 covers any work that's performed less than 6 feet from the edge of the roof. Obviously, this is a very vulnerable position, so a worker must be protected from falling with either a guardrail 
safety net, travel restraint, or personal fall arrest system. Zone two is for work conducted between six and 15 feet from the edge. The same fall protection as zone one could be used, or for work that is both infrequent, performed monthly or quarterly, and temporary, an hour or two on average. Companies can use a designated area visually marked by a flag system. Beyond 15 feet from the edge is considered zone three. The risk of a fall is much lower at this distance. While work in this zone is infrequent and temporary, the zone should ideally be amply delineated with adequate warning signage. However, at the very least, workers must be trained to avoid crossing over and entering zone two. Now that you know the different requirements for unprotected edges, what's the solution? At Key Safety, we've been protecting roof workers all over the world since 1934 and have a wide range of OSHA-compliant products for unprotected edges. In addition to the risk assessment matrix, we also use the hierarchy of fall protection to determine the safest, most appropriate solution for your specific situation. For zones one or two, we may recommend Key Guard, which is a non-penetrating guardrail system that can be configured for both metal or membrane roofs. Another option could be a key line system that can be utilized for either fall arrest or travel restraint. Featuring a modular design, this horizontal lifeline system is simple and fast to install. Finally, for a cost-effective solution in zones two and three, Key Mark is a freestanding warning line system with a heavy-duty weighted rubber base and mesh flags available for maximum visibility. Key Safety offers plenty of solutions for fall protection, and you can find them at www.keysafety.com because protecting the people who work for you keeps everyone safe. Perfect. Thank you, Jess, for playing that. Um, I know that was a little long for a standard video that you would see in a presentation, but it really does give us a quick overview of the new OSHA requirement for edges. And what I want to do is basically just pull a few key concepts out and share a little bit of experience that I've had. So we're going to break it down by zone, as we mentioned in the video. Zone one is work done less than six feet from the edge. And as the video stated, we can use four different solutions for the work being done in that area. Guardrails, safety net, travel restraint, or personal fall rest. Now, as I make recommendations, if I were to walk your roof, I would consider these areas to be extremely critical to protect. Reason being is that it doesn't take much for somebody to stumble at six foot or closer from the edge and their center of mass to go over the edge and for a hazardous or even a fatal fall to occur. So anything within six feet of the edge, I'm, I'm like, yep, yeah, we absolutely need to protect that. That is absolutely a top priority to do. Now, once we go to six to 15 feet, we introduce this term, infrequent and temporary. Um, and I want you guys, we will define that. So just take those terms and kind of stick them in, in the back of your mind for now. What this is saying is that if work is being done between six and 15 feet and the work is temporary and infrequent, we can use a designated area. Now, a designated area is a flag system. It cannot be a painted line. Now, there is a time and a place for painting your roof. We will talk about that coming up. Um, but just painting a line at six feet and saying, you know, hey, we just tell people to stay away, that is not considered a designated area. In OSHA 191029, which is the performance standard, um, we will, um, it talks about a flag system with flags visible from 20 feet using a cable that has a tensile strength of 200 pounds with post heights of 39 inches, sag in the wire no less than 34 inches. It is very clearly a physical barrier. And the reason for that is we don't, we're not trying to protect the guy who's reading the signs and following the rules. We're protecting the guy who's on the roof using his phone right? He took a phone call on the roof. Or we're protecting the guy who's distracted looking down at his, at his PM checklist as he's going unit to unit or carrying um, a box of filters and not thinking about where he is or working in an area with tools around his feet um, that might stumble backwards and cross that line. So I always point out that it has to be a physical barrier. Um, 
not and beyond that, I actually disagree with OSHA saying that a flag system is okay at six feet, right? I think that's kind of crazy. And I always use this as an example, right? Let's pretend that you're a normal worker. You have a unit at eight feet. His, he's standing at seven feet. And then there's a warning line behind him at six, right? And he just, you know, he's standing there and he just passes out and falls straight backwards. Where is his head in proportion to the edge of the roof? Well, he was standing at seven feet, he's six feet tall. So his head is within one foot of the roof edge. Now, let's say that a more realistic scenario is he's got a bunch of tools and stuff around his feet at seven feet away from the edge. He takes a step backwards, he trips, he takes two steps back. That warning line isn't going to stop him. It's not a guardrail. It's just a flag system. The average guy takes moves two and a half feet um, as he steps backwards. So he's traveled five feet out of seven. He loses his balance. His center of gravity moves over the edge, and it is a, it is a fatal fall, even though you have a warning line system. So even at six feet, I disagree with OSHA. Um, and I typically will recommend to my clients that we move that minimum used to 10 feet seems to make the most sense when you look at the math. Then what they say is that work is performed 15 feet or more away from the roof edge that, you know, we can use all of the systems that we talked about guardrails, travel restraints, safety nets, designated area, but you as the employer are not provided or are not required to provide fall protection provided the work is both infrequent and temporary and you implement and enforce a work rule prohibiting employees from going within 15 foot of the roof edge. And that's my question, right? How do your employees know where 15 feet is? So let's say that you fall into that category and you're saying, listen, most of my stuff is within 15 feet. How, how do they know that what's in your training? What it, what's the trigger or the key to let them know this is 15 feet. You have to have something on the roof that you can integrate into that training to make it actually enforceable. Um, and we'll, so save that as a concept. We'll talk about that in a minute. I just wanna look at a quick graphic that kind of ties into you know, what we've been talking about here um, and the different solutions. So if we look at this as far as like critical, moderate, and neutral, we can kind of tie these concepts together that anything from zero to six feet, if you ask me to make recommendations, that's gonna be on my critical list. We absolutely need to, um, to protect that. Uh, six to 15, protect it. Once we've protected the zero to six and then 15 foot plus, we take a look at the type of work that's being done. So I have a quick question. It's a pop quiz for you guys. It's a true or false question. Is a painted line considered a designated area? So this should be pretty, I feel like I really drove that one home on this one. So it should be a pretty straightforward uh, answer for you guys. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer that. And then what I'm gonna do is kind of tie all of this back into that risk assessment matrix that we've looked at in the beginning. Um, I think there's also some questions coming into the chat. So once I wrap this up, guys, I'll go back and read some questions uh, that come in and we will answer questions without, without any problem. Um, let's see if we have our results. Looks like they're coming in. That is false. That's correct. 24% uh, of you are just giving me a hard time. That's what I think that is. 76%, you guys got it. So let's take a look at that risk assessment matrix again and tie it into roof edge fall protection, right? What I like to do is switch that term likelihood with distance from roof edge. And it, once we switch that on the next slide, you'll see that we're able to tie in, you know, the closer we get to the edge, the more critical that hazard is on our risk assessment, the more important it is that we protect it. So when you have a representative from advanced come out, this is what they're going to be looking for. How are we getting onto the roof? What are we walking by while we're up there looking for skylights? And where are your units in relation to the edge of the roof? And then we can get you a phased out planned approach to get you 100% OSHA compliant um, on your rooftop. I promise you guys some definitions on temporary and infrequent. Um, temporary, 
OSHA considers it to be any task that takes less than one to two hours to complete. And infrequent is done at a sporadic basis. Um, and then they give some examples. Their examples talk about monthly replacement of batteries. So what I always like to talk about, or at least point out in temporary and infrequent, this kind of like clause that gives us some exceptions to fall protection is that you have to look at the task as a whole as being temporary, right? I'll have some clients and they'll be like, listen, we go up on that roof. We've got to service these HVAC units. You know, we need to do a full um, PM check on it. It only takes about an hour. I say, yeah, but you have six of them up there. So you're actually on the roof for six hours. So it's not really a temporary task. Um, infrequent, you know, OSHA considers infrequent to be monthly. I think that's pretty frequent, um, but that's just my opinion. Um, but even if you have a really short task that you're doing once a week, you know, like a lot of my clients, what they have to do is check rainwater samples on their roof um, to see what chemicals they're emitting into the um, environment. It only takes them five minutes to do that, but they have to do it every Friday. Well, that's not a, that's not an infrequent task. You know, we can't claim that. So we can talk about these, you know, when, when you have an, an expert come out and, you know, debate it, these terms were pulled directly from the federal register, which is a document that OSHA created. The link is in, in this presentation that we can share with you guys. If you're um, looking for some really interesting reading. As far as potential solutions, we're all about railing, guys. We're all about protecting the roof edge using a railing system that requires no training. We don't penetrate the roof if we can avoid it. We protect everybody that's up there. You know, it's called set it and forget it fall protection. Um, once it's done, it's done. So you can get those solutions quoted through your advanced roofing reps. Um, and hey, they'll Dan. provide you with a turnkey solution. Hey, Dan, this is Kevin. We had a, a question from Chris. And I think this slide would relate perfectly. What is the best guardrail system for the perimeter of a roof that will not vibrate and create acoustics and windy conditions? Can you talk about key guards, uh, wind rating and, and the solution there? Yeah, really good question. So if you notice in the bottom right hand corner, we have a key, our, what's called our key guard system. And that's a weighted counterbalance um, solution. What that allows us to do you see where those single weights are. They almost look like the head of a shovel. If we're in a high wind environment, what OSHA requires us to do is provide 200 pounds of resistance on the top rail. Our system is unique in that if we're in a truly high wind environment like Miami-Dade County, what we're able to do is add weights at the bottom and reduce uprights. So I can reduce the number of uprights, which basically is reducing the surface area exposed to the wind. And I can increase the amount of weight sitting on the roof holding that down so that I can maintain my 200 pound load compliance during a high wind event. So like the idea is like somebody could fall against it during a windstorm and we would still be protected. So we have extremely high wind ratings because of that and we're able to reduce the surface area. So I would say that solution in the bottom right-hand corner is the absolute best solution you're gonna find um, because we can reduce surface area exposure and increase weight. Great, thanks, Dan. We have another follow-up question to that. Is yep. the weight, and I just wanna clarify, are the weighted down guardrail systems acceptable when considering high velocity hurricane zone requirements like Miami-Dade? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, we have done, I mean, pages and pages and pages of wind calcs in different um, environments. I, Scott, can you jump in? He's our, our rep in Florida. What is the highest wind rating that we were able to get for Miami-Dade on our railings? Uh, our standard right now is 156 without adding additional weights. Uh, we just did a project over in Tampa, where we had to add a couple additional weights, some CB2s, which are uh, two weights instead of one, just to make sure that the system wouldn't slide at all. And that was specific to that, to that environment. Um, but as for Miami-Dade, we haven't gotten over any requests over 156. Yeah, so we can do 156 standard. Um, and then our engineers, we can engineer it by adding more weights and reducing more uprights. 
uh, to meet higher wind loads? So the answer is yes. Yes, we can. We just need to know what your specific requirements are, Sebastian, and then um, we can design to it. Hey, Dan, I think uh, one of the other parts of the question was noise. Have you had anybody that, you know, you had any complaints about too much noise when the wind's blowing? No. What's unique about our system is that it's held together using our key clamp product, which is actually our core product. Um, it's an 80 something year old company. What that product does is it's held together using cut point tech screw or set screws. So where a typical system like this is basically cotter pinned together, right? You'll have, it'll sit into a hole, cotter pin goes through and there's some movement in there. Ours are all pressure fit into the um, fittings using these cut point tech, sorry, I keep saying tech screw, I mean to say hex key head screws. Um, when we tighten them down, it's about 2000 pounds of axial force is needed to slide or move that. So we haven't had an issue with noise or vibration. Um, and we will use that same technology, those same key clamps to you to build work platforms in like for servicing jet engines and things like that, where vibration is a big deal, um, where they're worried about it shaking and coming loose. So we've, we've not had that as an issue, Rob. Any other questions you guys want me to keep on keeping on here? I'll, I'll keep moving. Um, key mark is our solution for demarcation. That's that um, non-penetrating warning line system, that designated area. It meets very specific requirements that OSHA has for designated areas. Um, so we can provide that as a solution. It has to be visible from 20 feet and it has to be installed six feet or more away from your roof edge. And I mentioned earlier that painting your roof absolutely does come into play, right? Because painting your roof when you're using it as part of your training to say, here's your walk path. It's 15 feet away from the roof edge or further. Your training is don't walk off the roof path for any reason. That's an acceptable training for OSHA. So I'm going to hand it over to Advance and they're going to talk about um, their yellow safety warnings for walkways and perimeters. Good afternoon, Mike Quinaren here. So there's a couple um, solutions um, depending on your roof system type. Uh, for walkways um, and perimeter um, lines. So for example, um, for all you, all the people out there that have uh, single ply roofs, uh, TPO, PVC, KE, there's always a high visibility walk pad available. Um, it is usually not the standard. Uh, standard is usually gray or an off darker color, um, but they are available in a yellow. Um, and one manufacturer does have an orange. Um, where we're able to do the, the walkways that go around all the serviceable equipment. Um, we highly advise that on all your serviceable equipment, you do have walkway, walk tread pads because the HVAC guy, the roofer always blames it on the HVAC guy or the electrician, right? That drops the screwdriver and puts the hole in the roof and then we get the leak call and then you're, you're stuck paying the bill, um, in which we don't want to see that happen. So if you have the walk pad there, that it does two things. One, it gives you another layer of protection on your roof for the people servicing your equipment because they are going to drop a screwdriver. They are going to accidentally, the toolbox is going to fall off the cart. Um, and then it also, the second thing it does, it provides you a standard walkway, um, a designated walkway on the roof. Um, we have also, um, so that's on single ply roofs and modified roofs. We, we have worked with coating manufacturers um, on either just doing yellow coating um, on these walkways um, around the perimeters and on all around all the serviceable equipment. Um, some customers, uh, we just did one for um, Broward College where we ended up coating the uh, majority of the roofs um, and, then, and then installing um, numbers, first responders on the roof. And as, so they can designate which building was which if, which if they were coming in from the air. Um, and then we installed um, designated walkways and perimeters around all the roofs. Um, so there's many different ways to do it depending on your roofing system. Um, it can be in coatings. Uh, it could be in additional materials. Um, in a high, high fluorescent material, yellow is usually the standard color. Um, it goes by the 
different fire departments have different roles, but we're happy to, to look at your roofing system and discuss what option might be best for you. Turn it back over to Dan. Cool. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, yeah, the term designated walkway is key from you know my world here on fall protection. So that's a great solution uh, for that. I'm going to start to kind of fly here to wrap it up within the hour. Uh, key line is a tie-off system that you would use to keep your guys safe. If you take a look at that next slide, you'll see a guy kind of tied off to the system. Um, it is an active fall protection solution. So there's a lot of training and engineering requirements that go on behind the scenes before you can do something like this. Um, but it's always good for kind of a very infrequented area, uh, cost-effective solution for that. And then we're going to jump down to the next one, which is um, another anchor point system. It's a non-penetrating anchor point designed to go onto flat roofs that two workers in restraint can use. Um, so it's a really good, super popular solution that we have um, for areas that need to be protected. And then guys, finally, I have one more um, hazard overview and that's obstacles on your roof. It's what do you do when the roof itself is the hazard, right? If you were to look at what are OSHA's top uh, violations or causes of injuries, it's actually the category slips, trips, and falls. So we've talked a lot about the falls, but we haven't talked very much about the slips and trips on your roof, right? I've been on roofs and it's covered in cable trays, ammonia lines. Um, the roof is super slippery and I'm going to slip and fall on it. The roof itself then becomes the hazard. So I pulled out just the general duty clause on this one because there is no specific um, rooftop hazard on this one. And that's just that we need to provide our uh, people with a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are likely to cause um, injury or death. And I think that that is pretty much covering it. And we need to think of the roof as a roof, as a work environment. And a lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind. So when it comes to solutions up on your rooftop, you know, we can pretty much custom build anything. You know, this crossover in the next slide, it shows you know, we've custom built to go up and over and under to provide you guys with a non-slip walking surface. We can put it on a standing seam roof, metal profile, flat membrane. Um, we can make it as long or as wide as you need to be. We can do small step overs like you see in the next slide where it's just a little platform to get over some cable trays uh, so that we don't have a trip hazard. We can provide a walkway system um, like you see in the bottom right hand corner that give you the ability to go up and across um, sloped roofs, metal roofs. We can give you a full stair system with guardrail on either side. And then finally, the next slide just shows our key walk with guardrail where we've integrated a sloped walkway system. So this is specifically for sloped roofs where I have to walk up or across the seams up to 35 degrees. We can provide you with a walkway, a flat walkway system with guardrail on one or both of the sides to protect the guys. So it's a very unique solution um, to a very common hazard that we have. And then the next slide just shows us um, different options and solutions that we've done uh, for that. So kind of to wrap this thing up, what I would say is the best thing that you guys can do to take the first step towards OSHA compliance on your rooftop is to get an expert out there to talk to you about it. Call Advanced Roofing, set up a free 15-point safety inspection with an expert where they can walk you through these solutions, give you a very thought out and logical plan to bring you up to um, OSHA compliance and work within your budget to make that happen. And we're gonna back them up 100% of the time any way that we can to make sure that we're giving you the highest quality solutions at the best possible uh, approach. So that's it from me, guys. I'm going to pass it back over to Advanced Roofing, and I just want to thank you guys for your time, and I'll answer any questions you might have. Awesome. Thanks so much for that information, Dan. We do have a few questions that came in throughout. Um, the first one, what is legally required for a private building to provide? Uh, we are a condo building with no employees. Yeah, I get this question a lot. So I'm going to answer it by saying, you know, I am not legal counsel, right? So I would seek legal counsel. Um, and I have sought legal counsel with our um, internal 
um, uh, law people here. And what they said is the way, the way that U.S. law is written, it all falls onto the building owner. Um, there's a law, a lawsuit that's actually really famous. It's like Forest versus some high school. I don't remember. Um, and the story was that some kids broke onto a rooftop at a high school. They were trespassing. They weren't supposed to be on that building. One of the kids fell through the skylight to the gym and was permanently disabled. The parents sued the school for not protecting their skylights and they actually won the lawsuit, which is crazy. Um, but, and that was hit the way that he answered the question is that even if somebody's trespassing, even if they're not your employee, you as the building owner are required to provide a safe environment. So that's how I always answer that question. But I always answer that with the caveat, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not trying to, to be, you know, legal counsel. I, th I think that you should talk to your, your own personal legal team. Thanks, Dan. Another question here. I saw that within six feet of the roof edge, you require certain protection systems. One of them being the fall arrest or a harness. Could the harness line used to secure yourself be considered a tripping hazard for workers? Yeah, um, technically, you know, a trip hazard is considered anything over four inches tall, right? And that wire on a typical anchor post system is between eight and 12 inches high. So yes, technically, um, a lot of times what people will do is integrate it into their training. So they'll have a, a tie off line that goes around the perimeter of their roof at 15 feet. And they just say, listen, guys, this is your training. Any work inside of that line, you can, you don't have to be tied off. Any work outside of that line, you have to tie off to it. So they will integrate that into the training. Um, and it's not the, it, you, your guys have to be aware of what they're working around on their roof and they have to be trained to be careful where they step while working at height. It has to be as part of your integrated training. Awesome. You got three more questions here and um, Mike answered this, but uh, your experience with doing uh, catwalks for cooling towers Um, catwalks for cooling towers, it depends on the height. So we've built stair systems that will go up in like a work platform at the top with guardrail around the whole thing. Uh, we've done that. We've had it where you have a cooling tower that, you know, what we'll do is we'll actually extend posts down to the ground with a non-penetrating guardrail and we'll either like kind of clamp around the top of it. And it's all, everything's custom, I guess is what I would say. We're really limited on a cooling tower to be about 13 feet. We struggle to protect anything over 13 feet um, unless we can mount into the cooling tower at the top. There's a lot of times it's just really just thin, crappy steel up there. So it's really hard to do that. Um, but if we can mount to it, we can do a custom guardrail system to fit any size or shape. If we can't mount to it, we're really limited on about 13 foot max. We can build Think of like a custom scaffold system with stairs going up to it to protect it. Okay, great, thanks Dan. What kind of maintenance is required to the different key safety products? It depends on the system. Um, guardrail, which again, I'm a huge believer in, it's set it and forget it fall protection. The only thing that we required as far as maintenance on guardrail is a, an, an annual visual inspection to make sure that nobody's messed with it. You wanna make sure that nobody went up there and loosened set screws, took you know, cut something on it, hit it with, while craning in, you know, uh, a new HVAC unit or something like that. So we just say a visual inspection. Um, when you're doing an anchor point or a horizontal lifeline, that has to be inspected by a competent person annually. So that is a very rigorous inspection requirement. So I want to uh, thank everyone again. Stay safe. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.